The measure of whether you learn something is not whether it was obviously true to you upon first glance. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx, and my first night sky was that of the Hayden Planetarium, right across the park. And the lights dimmed, the stars came out. I was enchanted by the immensity of it all, and the fact that we didn't know all the answers. I was attracted to the unknowns. And I, you can't be a scientist unless you're comfortable in what is unknown. You can't just require answers for everything. That's not how discovery works. Most of the time, we are befuddled. And when a journalist says, scientists have to go back to the drawing board with some new result that comes out, they don't understand what actually happens every day. We live at the drawing board. We're not sitting back with our legs up on the desk, basking in our mastery of the universe. No, if you're a research scientist, you're trying to figure stuff out every day. And the, the immensity of the unknowns at that point, I said, I want to participate in this. One of the things we know from research in psychology, as well as just practical matters in the conducting of scientific experiments, is that one of the lowest forms of evidence you could possibly invoke is eyewitness testimony. Which is odd because it's one of the highest forms of evidence in the court of law, which disturbs me greatly. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you come from a lab to a science conference and say, this is true, we say, how do you know this? Because I saw it. Well, that's really the end of your talk. And you just leave. <laughs> and then we say, come back when you have a chart recorder or you have to just give me something that does not have to flow through your senses. Because your senses is some of the worst data taking devices that exist. And science did not achieve maturity. Modern science did not achieve maturity until we had instruments that either extended our senses or replaced them. And Galileo, it's not an accident that we have modern science, as I've described it, uh, experiment, verification, this, these tactics, these methods and tools, began with Galileo and Francis Bacon. And Galileo was around 1600. That was the invention in that period of the microscope and the telescope. So it's not an accident that all this sort of came together at that time. So now we have people who are in the act of dying and they come back from life and they report on mental experiences. And that's intriguing. It, it's intriguing. Um, but because it is in the realm of eyewitness testimony, you can establish it perhaps as a personal truth, but it will take more than that to establish it as an objective truth. And an objective truth is the kind of truths that science discovers. And it's the kind of truth that is true whether or not you believe in it, okay? It exists outside of your culture, your religion, your political affiliation. Personal truths, if I may consider that, would be, okay, Jesus is your savior. That's your personal truth. You cannot convince someone else that Jesus is their savior in an objective way. You have to persuade them you have to persuade them in some, with, uh, in some cases by war, right? Look at the wars that have been fought between religions that did not agree about who was their respective saviors. So, so um, sure, we, Although I think if we I, if I walked on water, made you unblind, turned, got created loaves and fishes out of nothing. That would be amazing. I think. And we would like investigate that. Mm. And we would, t we would say, whoa, <laughs> Let, yes, we would. We would so, it would be an amazing thing. And then if we, if we cannot account for that for, by any other known laws of physics and it's only happening with you, that, when would we see, we'd wonder if you were like alien or something first, right? <laughs> but no, it would be so easy to demonstrate divinity if in fact you had the power you wanted to display. Do you see any like, intention or anything in like the ordering of this of the cosmos yeah so if uh intent is an interesting question when imposed on the universe for the longest while philosophically people imagined that the universe was some perfect place earth was a haven for life especially human life 
and everything is just right for us. And that would leave you thinking that there's some intent to the universe, that the universe is serving our needs. And of course, this is, as you would suspect, very strong in religious philosophies, where the adherents of that particular religion are sure that they are more special than any other religion, or more correct in so doing. When you look at the large-scale universe and you see these structures, what you have to ask yourself is, suppose all the galaxies were exactly equally spaced, rather than in these filaments and structures. Perhaps you'd be asking the same thing. Oh, look at, is there some intent here? Look how beautifully ordered it is. Ask yourself, is there some configuration of the universe where you wouldn't ask that? Because if there isn't, then the question doesn't actually aim towards a unique answer. If anything you see out there looks like it's ordered to you, then the question, you can't ask the question. You have to be able to ask the question such that if it were this other way, you would reject it. Now, the people who said Earth is a haven and all this, the fossil record argues differently. <laughs> 97, 8% of all life that ever existed is now extinct. That's the sign, not of a planet that loves its life. That's a sign of a planet that wants it to get the life the hell off. Right, that's okay? the, the anti-haven. Right, right, yeah. right. We are alive not because, but in spite of it. From tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, droughts, floods. Every year, they kill thousands of people. Thousands. You're kind of bumming me out, I have not, to say. I'm not done. <laughs> not to mention asteroid impacts. Took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Earth is in a shooting gallery. You want to say there's intent? Yeah, the intent is to kill us. Okay? <laughs> There's your intent. Wow. So, so the more you look at the universe, the less clear any purposeful intent there is. On that upbeat note, <laughs> uh, we're going to need to. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you want to upbeat? Give us when, one. When, when, the uni when, when, the, when the asteroid comes? Yes. Okay. Uh, if I'm we listening. have people who, who reject the science world and the asteroid is headed towards us, they will be doing a number of things praying, certainly. Uh, they'll be running away from the impact point. They'll be buying toilet paper and bottled water. And whereas, if you had scientists in your midst and engineers, when the asteroid comes, they say, how can I deflect that? <laughs> Two completely different outlooks on your fate. So I'm, if I'm bumming you out by saying there's disaster that will kill us, yep. I'd like to lift you up again by saying it may be that innovations in science and technology may be the only thing that can save us from ourselves. You debummed me. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. Line up a thousand people and give them a coin. And everybody said, flip the coin. And about half will get tails, half will get heads. If you got tails, sit down. That's 500 left, approximate. Mm -hmm. Have them flip. Half get heads, have 250 of you sit down. Now we're left with 250. Do it again. Go from 250 to 125, to 60, to 30, to 15, to eight, to four, to two, to one, okay? In this experiment, it's not, a, it's not an unthinkable experiment. Mm -hmm. This person who survived this exercise flipped heads 10 consecutive times. Now, here's what journalists do. They go up to that person and they say, how do you feel? Well, I, I knew I had felt that head's energy halfway through <laughs> and, I, and I was feeling it and I, did they ask anyone else if they felt oh, that head's energy? No, they only interviewed that guy. Okay? You come Wait, on I, I'm not done. Right. Wait, so <laughs> that person says, boy, I was lucky to flip heads 10 consecutive times. Well, every time, essentially every time you do this experiment, somebody's gonna flip heads 10 consecutive times. So you wanna say, oh, this is a special universe in which that happened, no. No, because of the, the nature of the, the fact that you have a thousand experiments happening all the time, there's gonna be one where somebody flips head, heads 10 consecutive times every time you do this experiment. That does not make it special. 
just because somebody flips heads 10, 10 consecutive times every time you do the experiment. So you're in a universe where this weird thing happens at the beginning and you want to feel all, feel all heads energy about it. And I'm saying <laughs> in a multiverse, there could be 999 universes where that did not happen. And you're in the one that did and you want special credit for it, I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> As an astrophysicist, we've seen throughout time the hubris that comes with any discovery that gets made, or the hubris that prevents the acceptance of a discovery that might demote your sense of self from whatever you previously imagined it to be. Among them is, where is Earth? Is it the center of all things? No, it's not even a significant planet in orbit around an ordinary star in the corner of a reg ordinary galaxy, one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And so here we are saying, let's search for life in the universe, intelligent life like us. Well, who are we to say that we're intelligent? I, I mean, I pose that not as a joke question, but it's a very serious question. We define ourselves to be intelligent in ways that no other creature can rival. Okay, now what do we credit that intelligence to? So you look at the genome, and let's take the chimp, I guess that's a really close relative of ours, and we have, what is it, 90, high 90s percent identical, indistinguishable DNA. And the chimp does not build the Hubble telescope, and the chimp does not compose symphonies. So we must then declare that everything we say about us that is intelligent is found in that one and a half percent difference in DNA. Is that first, is that a fair statement yeah. to make? Okay. Let me invert that question. If the genetic difference between humans and chimps is that small, maybe the difference in our intelligence is also that small. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the difference between stacking boxes and reaching a banana, putting up an umbrella when it rains, whatever are these rudimentary things a chimp does that the primatologists roll them forward and boast about, which of course our toddlers can do, maybe the difference between that and the Hubble telescope is as small as that difference in DNA. Because I pose the question, suppose there was another life form on Earth or elsewhere, that in that same sort of vector, that one and a half percent difference we are to chimps, suppose they were one and a half percent different from us. They would then roll the smartest of us in front of their hum humatologists and say, it's Hawking, there's Hawking. Oh, this one is slightly smarter than the rest of them because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head. <laughs> like little Timmy over here. <laughs> so I wonder if we're just blithering idiots in the presence of even a trivially smarter species than us. So therefore, who are we to even assert that, number one, we are intelligent and we're looking for others at least as intelligent as us out there to talk yeah. to? By but, the way, is there any other species on Earth that we can talk to? Can, can we have a conversation with a chimp that has nearly identical DNA? And I don't think we can actually say, hey, what movie do you want to see tonight? But you don't have that conversation with a chimp, yet somehow we believe we want to believe that an alien on another planet that's not even based on DNA, and even if it is, it's not nothing like us, that we could communicate with it. There's a set of four astrophysicists using recently declassified nuclear data from the war effort in 1957, deduce the origin of chemical elements in the universe as coming from stars that, that fused hydrogen to helium, to carbon, to nitrogen, to oxygen in their core, in the crucibles that are their core. And those stars then exploded, scattering that enrichment across the galaxy so that the next generation of stars have the ingredients that can make planets and those planets have the ingredients that can make life. It is the discovery that we are not just poetically, but literally stardust. We are not just simply alive in the universe. 
the universe is alive within us. And that, to me, is the greatest gift of modern astrophysics to civilization. It borders on the spiritual. So when I go out and look up, I don't think to myself, look how small I am in space and time. Yes, that's true, but look how big you are. You're made of the ingredients, the same ingredients that made those stars. That's a sense of meaning and purpose that uh, for me knows no equal. That is the cosmic result that I live with and celebrate daily. Cosmic discoveries have been on the world's headlines ever since they've been, ever since we've had telescopes. And so I think there's something deeply innate about our urge to look up and our urge to wonder what our place is in the universe. And I'm, it is a privilege that I get to make that my profession and do what Carl Sagan said, that when you're in love, you want to tell the world. 